Welcome to the internet, live from the Marriott Library at the University of Utah. This is the Red Line Podcast. I'm your host, Connor Dunstan, and these are my co-hosts. Oh. <laughs> I, was reading, so I was reading the head. Alex Fielder and... Kyle Holland. Today we're going to talk about commuter rail, one of the most common rail transit systems in the United States, and how we can make the commuter rail systems of today into something truly great. As usual, we'll talk about history, issues, and then go into how we can make our commuter rail better. But first, the news. Next up on Transit Transit, Don't Tell Me. (laughs) Today, we've received some of the best transit news we've heard in a long time. MTA has finally decided to trial screen doors at some of its stations following a rise in person versus train collisions. The doors are expected to go on trial in the next several years on the 7 platform at Times Square, the 3rd Avenue L station, and the Sutphin Boulevard station on the E. From the Red Line Podcast, this has been Transit News. So it's going to take them several years to trial this? It is a difficult thing to do because it's a lot of signaling stuff. Their signaling isn't designed for PSDs. Ah. Because PSDs, you have to pull in at exactly the right place all the time. So that's going to be fairly computerized as compared to the operator just stopping. Right. If you stop a door extra on the train currently, it doesn't matter. But if you do it now, you're just going to have people running into a glass wall. The history of commuter rail goes all the way back to the beginning of rail transportation itself. As passenger rail developed in the early to mid-1800s, areas near larger cities began to be connected to them by rail, allowing the workers to live in the suburbs and work in the city for the first time. The first such railroad in the United States was the Long Island Railroad, which is still one of the premier commuter rail systems in the country. It is the premier. It uh, is, in fact, the it premier. It is the, still the largest ridership commuter rail system in the United States. 360,000 passengers on a weekday. Yeah, and in North America also, coincidentally. Um, it also is the only commuter rail system in North America to operate 24-7 service. Oh, that's a beauty. That's yeah. a big deal. Well, it is it is technically part of MTA, so that's not unexpected considering how they run the subway. Shows what you can do if you, like, don't rip up all your rails and rebuild (laughs) them 50 years later, and also if you're in New York. That is true. And there's money. But commuter or regional rail, as we prefer to call it, uh, remained the premier way for commuters to get from suburbs to the city until World War II, with systems being built all over the country. Back in the day, wasn't there not as much of a clear distinction as we have now? Like, your commuter line could just be a trolley line that just kept going, or it could be an interurban line. Well, that's right. Here in Salt Lake City, uh, up until 1952, I believe, we actually had an electrified commuter rail line, which ran using sort of like trolley-esque cars that ran the same route as the Salt Lake City to Ogden Frontrunner section does today. Wow. So we, uh, you know, just tore it out and rebuilt it uh, less than 60 years later. At, at massive <laughs> you love to see it. Don't at you? massive expense. And the top speed of the old one was 75 miles an hour. Now it's 79. Wow! Look at the in advantages modern technology has brought us. Dude, we should have <laughs> just kept that and just slapped some bi-level cars on it and got on with life. I, yeah. I'm glad it doesn't run at 80 degrees, because 80 degrees, 80 miles per hour, because <laughs> that would be a bit too much. Oh, that would oh, be too yeah. fast. That'd be dangerous speed. 79 is perfect. <laughs> perfect. But, 125, more like no. But unfortunately, as with all things transit, the advent of the car changed, and by changed, I mean destroyed, everything. As the federal government poured money into highways, freeways, and all manner of roads during the 40s, 50s, and 60s, not to mention set up zoning regulations <laughs> and helped fund housing projects. Oh boy. That were um, very pro car and anti transit. The popularity of commuter lines declined sharply, and before long, lines all across the country were being shut down. 
By the early 1960s, the private companies that had operated almost all the lines in the United States were on the verge of bankruptcy. Gosh, remember good old <laughs> for-profit rail? That was a beauty. Well, and these lines were run by, like, mainline railroads. Yeah, that's back when like, they did pasture because it was profitable and cool. Right. So, like, you would have your Union Pacific Railroad. You would have, of course, your inner city. But they would also run the commuter lines if you were in a large city. So it was quite an interesting system. Uh, and it was about the same time, unfortunately, that the number of passenger miles carried on commuter rail lines just, like, reached its very bottom point. Like, we've all seen, I'm sure, those graphs of transit ridership. And it's like, in the 1940s, it's up here at 100%. And then it just crashes straight to the ground and then it's been slowly inching its way back upwards ever since so that's fun <laughs> so anyways we now enter the era of amtrak or the modern passenger rail era to save commuter rail from extinction local and state governments began stepping in by subsidizing extended rail service Unfortunately, uh, there were kind of some negative results to these governments subsidizing it because it was still the same railroad companies that had always operated uh, the commuter rail lines operating them. Unfortunately, uh, these agreements had some really severe impacts on the quality of service because while these local governments and MBTA and MTA and all these different agencies are funding the same operations that are still run by these same railroads, they're not paying for upgrades to rolling stock or track or anything like that. So they're paying for gas and operators, but they still have all the same stuff they did like back in the 1920s. So this is just ancient garbage. And before long, it just got to a really bad point and states were forced to take over commuter rail lines as the result of several acts of Congress in the 1970s and 80s. And these included the Rail Passenger Service Act of uh, 1970, which created Amtrak, which did take over uh, most inner city rail service, but not commuter rail lines. Those were run by more local transit agencies? Yeah, well, at this time, they're still being run by the freight railroads. Oh, were they still, like, viable economically back then? No, they're being massively subsidized by local governments. Right. <laughs> and, and they're then, not that great. That's right. Then uh, came the Regional Rail Reorganization Act, which created Conrail, which then took over freight operations in the Northeast U.S. from, like, five different bankrupt rail companies. Uh, small problem... These rail companies were uh, the ones running the commuter rail lines. So somebody had to take those over. And Conrail took those over. But unfortunately, these are all just like massively varied systems at this point. Like some of them are running as main lines. Some of them are running in different ways. It's just a mess. And Conrail's like, oh, crap, I have to run 40 different systems all at the same time. And they're all different. It's so complex. So the government was like, na na na, and passed the Northeast Rail Service Act of 1981, which freed Conrail from the responsibility of operating all those commuter rail lines. The municipalities had to directly take them over. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot. It's, it was kind of a mess. <laughs> yeah. Although I do wish we had something like that Northeast Rail Service Act for, you know, the rest of the country. <laughs> because you've seen how well the Northeast Corridor is doing now. They've got their rail together yes, really good. And nobody else does. That is very true. Except sort of, and I'm very hesitant to say this, sort of California. They have Amtrak, they have Caltrain, they have the different commuter rail systems, and they have the boondoggle whose name shall not be spoken, the hundred million dollar California, or hundred billion dollar, excuse me, <laughs> California <laughs> high speed rail project, which is so massively over budget and over, over everything that, uh, well, you give high speed rail a bad name. <laughs> uh, at this time, most of the legacy commuter rail systems like Metro, the MBTA lines, Long Island Railroad, and the PATH trains between uh, New York and New Jersey were taken over by various state and local transportation agencies. Right, and just a quick note on the PATH, because it's a real weird system. It's basically a subway line. Like, it's all underground. It uses metro rolling stock, and it goes under the river to connect to the New York subway, but it's run by the Port Authority of New Jersey and New York instead of uh, MTA for reasons. That's and so And it's regulated under commuter rail standards instead of subway standards. Um, so <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a weird little guy. <laughs> Just for my clarification, what is the Port Authority? Because I have no idea. 
It is I've, so much. I've like, never figured it out. I, the port like, authority, they run the port, obviously, <laughs> but they also just run a whole bunch of other things like ferries and the path train and just like, it's a whole thing. I don't even know the extent of things at the port authority. I, so. I, I kept seeing that everywhere when I was in New York and I was like, so what they does func- this mean? Do they like function like a municipality? <laughs> it's almost like a county, except it covers like... <laughs> 15 different counties and like 300 different cities. A um, meta county. It's kind of like um, so Portland Metropolitan Area directly elects like a regional government called mm-hmm. Metro. They're the only place in the country to do that. It's kind of like that but unelected and not. So, <laughs> so it's just like comparison. it's just like this big company that can do stuff. Yeah, it's like, like a big agency that can do a whole bunch of different things. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's New York. Stuff's got to get done. <laughs> the Swiss Army <laughs> Knife of Corporation. It is the Swiss Army Knife of uh, New York area agencies, yeah. I keep saying corporations, but yeah, agencies. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, getting back to where we were before we went on a tangent about PATH, um, (laughs) a similar process happened in Canada with the Toronto commuter network being taken over by Go Transit, famous today if you watch Not Just Bikes or RM Transit, and the system in Montreal being taken over by the agency now known as the RTM. Cool. Yeah. (laughs) That's just a side note because I figure... Canada, no offense, but you're you're very similar to us in a lot of ways. So yeah, Canada's like except that whole Quebec thing. That's that's pretty special. But at the same time as all this is going on, massive growths in highway congestion, thanks to induced demand, prompted many localities to seriously reconsider the way that they'd been building transportation infrastructure, and many new commuter rail lines began to be built. This is about the same time as we started building light rail as well. So you kind of see this like late seventies, early eighties movement of being like, well, crap, highways aren't working, so we gotta try something. You know, that was a pretty short life cycle for highways. Because yeah. we had our car boom starting in, like, what, the 20s and 30s? And then really kicking off in post-war 50s, 60s, and it just went downhill from there. Well, you see, basically anyone with any brains who was involved in urban planning realized almost immediately after the highway system was built that it was a bad idea. <laughs> and I'm, I'm literally not kidding, because, like, there were sometimes, like, 20 years after these big highways had been built into cities, massive movements to remove them and to turn them into public space and boulevards and reconnect neighborhoods. Like, yeah, it was real short life cycle where people thought highways, where people who actually knew what they were talking about thought highways were a good thing. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad we're back to sane land only a century later. Except not, because despite people who know stuff, uh, knowing that highways are bad, people who don't are still in charge and making more highways. <laughs> oh boy, we have a massive transit culture problem. Yes, we do. Massive. Um, the first of these, and these are called the new start systems because they're just brand new, like they're not legacy systems, like all the ones that were somehow survived the great car attack. Because the Northeast Corridor is just so cool, I'm jealous. Sure. Uh, the first of these was in Southern Florida, uh, where Tri-Rail began operation in Miami Metro in uh, 1989, and other cities followed suit relatively quickly. LA's Metrolink opened in 1992, the San Diego Coaster in 1995, and then Dallas-Fort Worth's TRE system in 1996. That's pretty quick, isn't it? Oh yeah, like, it's the same thing with the early light rail systems, like, everybody just got this idea at the same time and was just like, time to build! (laughs) That's what we like to see. Yeah, Yeah. sounds good to me. Um, The one catch, though, is that most of these new commuter rail systems were just that, commuter rail. They only ran rush hour-ish service and had limited service frequencies outside of that. Yeah, I mean, most of these newer, uh, new start systems just didn't run all day service. They just ran, like, four trains in in the morning, four trains out in the evening. It's literally just for commuters. So that sort of really limited its use as an actual transit system. And building commuter rail systems like this with express commuter service only is doing things quite literally backwards. You're skipping out on that basic backbone transit and just adding the extra rush hour spice on top. 
this sort of commuter rail, it's just encouraging car culture more. It's just saying, like, this is exclusively built to relieve highway congestion. Yeah, it's not a, like, cohesive transit solution. No, not so at all. It's more just like a band-aid then, isn't it? It's not even a band-aid because, <laughs> like... It's a liquid bandage? It's, yeah, it's just not great. The Not Just Bikes video linked, uh, the trains subsidize suburbia. Go Transit, even now, builds massive, like, obscenely massive park and ride lots at some of their commuter rail stations. And that's despite uh, a relatively decent bus grid in most Toronto suburbs. So, like, yeah, a lot of the issues with commuter rail began sort of with this mentality that we're doing this... For 9 to 5 office commuters. Yeah, and to keep people off the highways so that other people can drive on the highways. Yeah. Although I'm hoping that'll start to turn around real quick. Like, here we have Front Runner, which has had all day service since, like, ever. Inception. Yeah, and since the pandemic, we've realized that maybe the 9 to 5 office commute is quite literally the least important commute. <laughs> Yes. And maybe we should be providing transit options for literally every other possible commute and every other trip people might ever want to make. I agree. So sort of despite the limited usefulness, I would say, of these systems, America was into this crap. Mm -hmm. We were like, hmm, that looks pretty cool. So starting in 2000 uh, and ending in 2017, we sort of had a second new wave of commuter rail construction with 11 new systems opening between the year 2000 and 2017. This included the WES in Portland. Or just WES. WES. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's I... what they call it. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, the famous Sounder in Seattle and the Front Runner here in Utah. And most of these new services operated on a peak hour only schedule, similar to the ones that came before it. And uh, this is not that great. No, it's not. And we should, of course, mention again that Front Runner is not. Hashtag not like other commuter rail systems <laughs> in that it has all day regular service uh, and just runs some peak service and rush hours. Of course, that all day service isn't that good because it's every hour, but you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but yeah. Front Runner functions more like what we're leading into, which is true regional rail that just moves people around wherever and whenever they want to go. It's not just a highway band aid. It's not a highway band aid. I like that. And that's where commuter rail is today. There are 32 operational commuter rail systems across the country, the majority of which, if they are, especially if they aren't legacy systems like MBTA, Metra, uh, New York, etc., just run peak hour service. And those that don't run peak hour service almost always have really poor service frequencies outside of peak hours, like Front Runner half hour service and peak hours that's passable but it goes to an hour service and it closes at midnight yeah. so it's only it's only friendly for the nine to five commuters it's even though it runs all day service it's still very much geared towards nine to five commuters and that's the same thing with even most of the the legacy commuter rail systems like in chicago and boston like they'll run trains all day but the only good service is during nine to five commute hours well that's no good is it no it's not <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's really really not and, and furthermore with the exception of front runner because we're cool <laughs> a lot of these commuter rail systems are shuttling people in from like far out into the city and back they don't have those ring and inter suburban connections right which is a problem in all sorts of rail systems but especially these yeah, and of course, as usual, New York provides the shining standard light for everyone <laughs> in the fact that the LIRR, Long Island Railroad, runs 24-7, 365. 365. <laughs> Dang. New, New Year's, Christmas, Thanksgiving. Because mm -hmm. what if you want to go into town for to see the ball drop? Wow. You ride the Long Island Railroad to the subway to Times Square, and you Those watch the ball drop. You ride the... get good, good hours. Yeah, I'm imagining that they get decent uh, <laughs> holiday pay. I'd, I'd bet. What do they do for maintenance? Do they just have enough track? You have enough track. You reroute the trains on a single track routing sometimes. Or Isn't you that just, beautiful? Or you just build it well enough that you don't need <laughs> to maintain it that much. <laughs> yeah. Um, Wait, if Front Runner does maintenance, uh, maintenance, theoretically, on, in air quotes, <laughs> <laughs> on Sundays, then why doesn't it have 24-hour service the rest of the week? Money. Oh. 
and because if you're not going to have anything to connect to it, it's not any use. Oh, right, because we don't have night buses. We don't have night buses, night tracks, night UVX. We have night nothing. <sighs> yeah, that so, makes sense. So uh, after Free Fair February, are we going to get, like, night transit night? Unlikely. But, so, um, as a result of the very poor and very limited service provided by a uh, significant portion of even... Let's be honest, guys. Even the LIRR and the legacy systems provide very poor service compared to global counterparts. Most of our commuter rail systems have just, like, abysmally low ridership, especially if you consider it per mile of the system. So, front runner, right? Yeah. 80-some miles, 84 miles long, I think. Yeah. Back in the good old days, it was getting 20,000 riders a day. Let's do some math in your head of how many riders it's getting per mile of track. Not great, right? Yeah. That's 250 people per mile of track, which is just bad um, by any metric. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a similar, similar ridership situation for most other systems. Yeah, because when you run commuter rush hour only service, you're not creating the paradigm shift that transit needs to create. You're just creating, like we said, a highway band-aid. Like, if you're making use of one of these commuter rush hour trains, then I guarantee you have another way to get around. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And, I mean, when I say uh, abysmal ridership, very low, especially if you consider, like, the S-Bahn in Berlin or the RER in Paris. Like, there's a reason that our commuter rail systems are not doing well, and it's because they are structured for commuters. They're not true regional rail systems. Right. So, sort of, how can we fix this? And I think the answer is, let's look at transit a little bit like we look at roads. So Kyle, you run it down for me. Buses are your local streets. They are your destination, and they get people right to the doorstep of where they're going. Failing that, maybe a couple blocks away if you're going to the suburbs. Well, sure, you got to walk a little bit. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, urban rail, like subways, light metro, and light rail. Uh, are if like, you have to. Yes, if you have to. <laughs> Light metro and rail metro are preferred because great separation. Yeah. Those are like smaller <laughs> arterials carrying people between neighborhoods, between districts, between cities in your metro area at higher speed, higher capacity, and a qualitatively better service. Sure. And then we come to commuter rail, which we would want to be regional rail. And it fills this gap between urban rail and inner city passenger rail. So it's like your big arterial roads, like your State Street. It carries people between smaller towns within a larger metro area, and it carries large number of people over long distances at a relatively quick speed. That's how we should be focusing on our regional rail. So, how can we turn our commuter rail into regional rail? More service. Run, don't run four trains in in the morning and four trains out in the evening. Run a train every half hour. That's right. I am personally, as a Francophile myself, a big fan of the RER. So, Paris, right, they have one of the densest metro networks in the world. It's just a ton throughout the center city. But what a lot of people miss when they look at the metro, they're like, oh, wow, this is so impressive, yada, yada, is the RER, which is their suburban rail or regional rail network. It's almost as dense as the metro. And it just fans out into the suburbs with frequencies of 15 minutes or better and high speeds. It's shuttling people at all hours of the day between the banlieue, which is suburbs in French because I had to be pretentious, and the central city of Paris. It interconnects with the tramways and metro lines and bus services, and it just sort of rounds out the entire system. And what's super interesting about it is it operates like a metro downtown, and then when it goes out into the suburbs, it operates like commuter rail. Brilliant. Isn't, that's perfect. I know. <laughs> that's why they get getting rid of roads, then. It's because they actually have a good system. They can get rid of roads. They don't, because need, roads. <laughs> they don't need roads in Paris. Paris. En, per- en Paris is ne, uh, let's see, is ne avoir besoin pas le road. I don't know what road is in French, but they yeah. don't need them. <laughs> yeah. They, they rode, I don't know. They <laughs> but if you're a bigger fan of Germany, you could say we need to operate our commuter rail more like an S-Bahn, which is like the same thing, except it mostly runs on the surface. 
or right. uh, the London Overground, or, <laughs> or, 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 or. Pick your favorite. So anywhere, European male. yeah, anywhere in Europe. Anywhere, anywhere. I mean, Tokyo has an extremely impressive regional rail system. Most cities in China do. It's anywhere except here. Anywhere except North America, basically. So yeah. One thing that we should mention, though, is that some people already have already realized this. So the great folks at Go Transit, who unfortunately still have this parking obsession, they are doing something right because they are preparing to electrify their entire network, which is uh, huge, uh, and also massively increase service. So I saw a statistic on their website that says they currently run something like 2,000 trains per week. They are going to be running 6,000 trains a week by the end of the decade. Wow. So they are... Uh, tripling. Tripling service. Tripling service. So that'll that'll take them from a commuter rail system to quite possibly a true regional rail proper system. Proper regional rail system. It doesn't have to run 24-7, but it will be a proper regional rail system that connects with the subways, with all the new light rail lines that they're building all over Ontario, and with their bus networks, and Viva Improved Bus Service, so, and all sorts of good things. So if you miss the train, it's not a big deal. It's not it's a not big like deal. It's not like missing the front runner, if where you, miss you the show up an hour later. <laughs> yeah. So taking, like, these steps, even just, let's say on front runner, starting out by increasing frequency to 30-minute frequency... Just taking steps to make it accessible as an all-day backbone of your transit network is how we're going to turn American commuter rail systems into proper regional rail like the rest of the world. And maybe add Sunday service, too. And, yeah, no, definitely add Sunday service. I think that's essential. That's very essential. Seven days a week, at least. (laughs) Preferably eight. Because that's another thing that we should mention. Yeah? A lot of these commuter rail services don't run on weekends. No. No. Uh, Yes, I only go downtown to work my 9-to-5 office job. Then I immediately leave and never do anything else downtown. (laughs) Well, yes, that's the idea. Because we want you to (laughs) stay in the suburbs, of course, all the time. Mm, Yes, downtown (laughs) should not not be bustling centers of commerce and activity. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, why would they? No, no. Yeah, why that, would That would they? be awful. That would be a real I'd terrible hate to see situation. Tons of people walking downtown. I would, that would be the worst thing ever. Uh, so if you are listening, thank you so much for listening. Please remember if you're on YouTube to like and subscribe. Smash that like Smash button. Smash that like button. Say something controversial in the comments. Yes, please do. We, we do like getting comment engagement and like and subscribe. If you're on Spotify, hit that. Smash that that like button. Give us five five stars. There's no there's no like button. Smash the star rating. Give us smash the five star button. Smash the follow button. Uh, You can also look at go to our website trlpod.com. Smash the play button to listen to our other episodes. (laughs) Our primary sources for this episode are going to be listed because I'm too lazy to read them out. Uh, The one you should read though is at streetsblog.org and it's called What American Commuter Rail can learn from Paris. So, yes, thank you for listening, and thank you, Mike Christensen, for being our one and only patron. But hopefully you'll have a buddy soon. Hopefully you'll have a buddy soon, yeah. We we do appreciate all Patreon donations. All of it goes back to podcast things like flyers, website, etc. So yeah, even a dollar, even a dollar helps, and nice. and you do get extra content from us where we just ramble mostly. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll say what we're rambling about in the title, so you can listen to the rambles that interest you. That's right.